Hey friends, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter five. If you don't have a traditional Bible, but you'd like one, just raise your hand and one of my friends will bring you one. You can also open up the YouVersion app or the Bible app and all the notes and scriptures, those have already been uploaded. Of course, we'll also put the scriptures right up here on the screen. If you're watching us online or at one of our other sites or one of our services at the Brown County Correctional Facility, I love you and I'm so glad that you are a part of our family. I hope your fast is going great. I mean, guys, you're one third of the way there. I mean, basically you're done. <laughs> you could do it, don't give up. I, I also hope that you've been praying about what God would have you do for our first fruits offering, January the 23rd. Remember, we're gonna take a second offering. Breakthrough 22, what is it that you want God to do? We're gonna continue in this series that we've been in in the book of Ephesians on identity today. You know, one of the greatest gifts of my life is getting to be a dad. I, I mean, I can't even describe how much I love it, probably because Sonny and I had such a, a hard time having kids. In, in fact, in 2002, we had a geneticist tell us that we were never gonna be able to have kids and that we should just think about adoption. But honestly though, at that time, we really had no interest in that route. Not that there was anything wrong with it, I guess I just wanted to have kids of my own. I, I wanted to have a kid with my eyes or Sonny's, my, my ears uh, or Sonny's lips. A year later, miraculously, we had Isaiah and, and 18 months after that, again miraculously, we had my daughter Aubrey. And I, and I can't tell you how full my heart has been since they were born. I will say, since we had Aubrey, I have, I have thought about adding to our family through adoption a number of times. Like, like every time I watch the show's Parenthood or, or This Is Us. Especially now that I'm about to be an empty nester. Like, I'm gonna miss my baby so much being able to walk into their bedroom every night and, and uh, run my fingers through their hair and, and kiss their cheeks and and pray over them. Uh, I've thought about adoption a number of times around the holidays. The thought of having a table full of kids coming back home is just so cool to me because I love being a dad. I think it's my greatest calling. It's definitely my greatest joy. And I think the Bible's pretty clear it's God's too. It's why you're here, like, like why you're on earth, not, not where you're sitting. I wanna talk about that today in a message we're calling, I Am Adopted. Let's pray. God, we love you. We honor you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your deep love for us, your adoration, your affection, the way that you look at us, the fact that, that we're the apple of your eye, we're the pride of your life, we're the joy, we're the laughter, we're all of the things that you look upon and say, it is very good. And so today, for my friends, I pray our hearts and our minds would be expanded. I pray against insecurity. I pray against wounds. I pray against obstacles, walls that we've built that have separated us from you, that brick by brick, piece by piece, those things would come down, that we would give access to our Father. To you, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one of Paul, the guy who wrote this letter to the Ephesians, one of his favorite images for God is that of a father. He, he makes eight references to it in this letter to the Ephesians alone. In fact, he opens the letter in chapter one, verse two, and he closes it in chapter six, verse 23, speaking of this image of God the Father. I mean, I mean look what he says in chapter five, the long scripture alert. <laughs> he says, since you're God's dear children, mm, you need to try to be like him. Your life, it has to be controlled by love, just as Christ loved us and gave his life for us as a sweet smelling offering and sacrifice that pleases God. Since you're God's people, gosh, I love that. Since you're my people, God says, since you're God's people, 
It's not right that any matters of sexual immorality, indecency, or greed even be mentioned among you, and it's not fitting for you to use language that's obscene, profane, or vulgar. Instead, you should give thanks to God. You can be sure that no one who's immoral, indecent, or greedy will ever receive a share in the kingdom of God. Don't let anyone deceive you with foolish words. It's because of those very things that God's anger will come upon those who don't obey him. So have nothing at all to do with those kind of people. You used to be in the darkness, but, but since you've become God's people, you're in the light. So live like people who belong to the light. It's the light that brings a rich harvest of every kind of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Try to learn what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the worthless things people do, things that belong to the darkness. Instead, bring them out to the light. It's really too shameful even to talk about the things they do in secret. And when all things are brought out to the light, their true nature is clearly revealed. For anything that's clearly revealed becomes light. That's why it said, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from death, and Christ, he will shine upon you. So be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people, but instead live like wise people. Make good use of every opportunity you have because the days they're evil. Don't be fools. Try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. Don't get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to each other with the words of psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing hymns and psalms to the Lord with praise in your hearts. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, always give thanks for everything, and here it is, to God the Father. I mean, it's long, but, but this is such an interesting, robust passage. It, it gives us such a detailed, practical list of do's and do nots. In fact, it, it's six things you should do not, bad grammar, good theology, six things you should do not, and nine things you should do. So, so let's start with six things you should do not. Number one is do not engage in sexual immorality or impurity. And it's, it's like this big junk drawer of stuff that you shouldn't do. Premarital sex, extramarital sex, porn, friends with benefits. I mean, anything sexually immoral or impure. It, it's just like a, like a big bucket of nastiness. Don't do any of it. Number two, do not be greedy. And actually the Greek here, it says that we shouldn't be covetous. Do not be covetous. Like that's saying, don't look at stuff you don't have and be mad that you don't have it or jealous that someone else has it. Number three, do not use language that's obscene, profane, or vulgar. And that's pretty vague. Like that's cussing, it's gossiping, it's insults, it's making fun of people, it's crude talk, sexual innuendos, dirty jokes, that's what she said. Watch your mouth. Number four, do not associate yourself with sinful behavior. And so this is like, if people are doing something that's wrong, you as a Jesus person, you can't do what they're doing. I, I had a friend way back in the day who she came up with this great saying, her name was Jeannie Mayo, probably the greatest youth pastor who's ever lived. She said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Number five, do not take part in things that need to be done in the dark. And, and it, like he goes on and he says, like these things are too shameful to even talk about. And I go, like, I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna picture those things. Like in that culture, can you imagine? Like it was so, raw back then. Like, can you even imagine the things that would have been too shameful for Paul to even talk about those things? He says, like, don't do anything that needs to be done in the dark. And number six, do not get drunk. That's kind of random. Like, it's all these other things, and then he just, and then he just kind of throws that in. And it doesn't say, do not drink. It says, don't drink too much. Don't be excessive. Like, I'm sorry, drunkest city in America, but number six in the things that we should not do is do not get drunk. Then, then here are nine things that, that Paul says you should do. Here, here's number one. You should imitate God. I mean, it feels like, like the list could end right there, doesn't it? This is sort of a definition of your life. Like, 
Like, what would God say? What would he do? What would God give? How would he respond or react? What, what would God think or what would he feel? And all of life now needs to become God-centered. It needs to revolve around who he is, what he would do, what he thinks, what he feels. Number two of the things that we should do is we should walk in love. And, and this is a habitual, ongoing lifestyle where you love people. And that, that includes generosity, it includes affection, it includes service, investment in people, time that you give to them, attention that you give to them. Walk in love. Number three, you should walk in the light. And, and here's what this is. It's being honest about your own sin. It's putting it all out in the light. First John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. When we put it in the light, it means walking in the light means talking to God and other Jesus people about our sins, about our struggles. Hello, accountability. Hello, journey to wholeness. Number four, discern what pleases God. Life moves from this idea of, of what do I want to this idea of what does God want? Should I do this or not do this? Should I say this or should I not say this? Should I give this or not? Number five, walk as wise. I don't know if you've noticed this, um, but particularly where we're at right now as a society, the world is filled with foolishness. There are some things that aren't sinful, but they are stupid. Don't do those things. <laughs> Walk in wisdom. Six, make the best use of time. In other words, don't squeeze or schedule God out. Don't put everything in your life as a priority over him. What is it that you're doing that's crowding God out, that's pushing God out, that's making it so you don't have time for God, so that you get to the end of the day and you go, oh, I, I didn't spend any time with him, I didn't pray, I didn't get in my word. How is it that you're not prioritizing God? Number seven, be filled with the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit has kind of gotten this weird bum rap, like, like he's a a great interrupter, like he's a person who messes up church services and makes people say and do weird things. And some of you have been in churches where, you know, somebody got a shofar and they blew it like they were a Ricola commercial or they got a, a, a flag with a gold sparkly lion on it and they waved it around and, and, they, just, and they just acted weird. Here's the deal, the Holy Spirit's not weird. Some people are weird, but the Holy Spirit's not weird. And he's just waiting. The minute that we enter into a relationship with the Father, the Holy Spirit is waiting to come and be our comforter. Like if your life is jacked up and it's like confused and all in a disarray, you've got to be filled with the Spirit. You've got to make room. You've got to take some stuff out so that there's space for him. Number eight, and this is a weird one is Paul says, sing in passionate worship to God. Now, some of you dudes especially, you're like, bro, I don't sing. I mean, this is why the Bible says, make a joyful noise. We don't all have to be able to sing like we're Michael Buble. Like, they're just sing, man. Like, there's people who are joyful, sing. They hum, they whistle, as my dad would say. They got a song in their heart, and so, like, what do you do? Like sing in passionate worship to God, even if it's just alone. Like get out there and find something where you can communicate. The, the King David was a great example of this. And finally, number nine is give thanks. That's simple, but it's huge. So, so now, here's the question. How are we going to do this? Like that's a list. Six do nots and 10 do's. I mean, I mean, how many of you stopped taking notes or you even tuned out because the list got too long? You, you were like, I don't, uh, I mean, bro, look, like that's a lot. <laughs> and I'll give you that, it is a lot, right? But imagine being the children of Israel, just in the first five books, which are incidentally called the law, there are more than 600 do's 
or do nots, more than 600 rules or 600 laws. How in the world do you even remember them? Never mind obey them. How do we follow them? Well, we change our perception of God and our perception of ourselves. Rather than seeing God as the rule giver and us as the rule keeper, we realize we've been adopted by God into his family. Like he's our father and we're his kids. So, so we're not just learning rules. We're getting to know our dad. We're, we're learning, we're asking, what would he do and what would he not do? How, how would he respond and how would he react? And the more we can answer those kind of questions of what he would do and how he would react, the more we can be imitators as beloved children. Like, when you're in a relationship with your dad, you pick stuff up from him, little nuances. Uh, for example, I cough like my dad, and it's super weird. And it, I used to think that my dad had the most annoying cough on earth. And then one day I was walking down the hall, and I heard a cough, and I realized that it was me. And I had the same cough as my dad. My, da my daughter, Aubrey, for example, she picks up trash when she sees it, like, like I do. My son, he... He wipes the faucet sink and counter in a public restroom after he uses it, just like me. I didn't teach them to do those things any more than my dad taught me how to cough. You just sort of pick things up through proximity. If you're a follower of Jesus, your relationship with God, it's a relationship with a father. And the layers of that are so rich that it's, it's hard to convey it actually into a single message. And the most curious thing about this language is, in, in Paul's time, it would have actually been illegal to refer to someone as a close relative if they weren't legally related to you. Like by doing so, it, it risked confusing the inheritance rights that were only distributed to close family members upon a person's death. And so for you to infer that you were related to someone that you weren't legally related to, you could be imprisoned for that. And so, so Paul, he solves that legal issue by using the language of adoption, which, which would have been revolutionary language at that time. This was during the height and the reign of the Roman Empire where, where kids were totally disposable. Kids who were born into poor families, for example, they were oftentimes just simply discarded. Infant mortality rates, they were, they were super high. 40% of children died before their fifth birthday. Most people actually wouldn't even name their kids until they were 10 days old because so many kids died in their first week. Of those who did survive among poor families, if it was a girl, they would literally throw her away. They would abandon her in the wilderness for wild animals to eat, or they would put her on a garbage pile or literally throw her on the top of the dung heap. If it, if it was a boy born with any kind of disability, same thing as a girl, or they'd, they'd tie a millstone around his neck and throw him in the sea so that he would drown. These kids, they had, they had no protection. They had no rights. So what would happen is, is when those kids got discarded, scandalous people would come along and they would, they would take those kids. They would pick them up and the girls, they would be subjected to this horrific abuse or they'd be sold into prostitution and the boys who were healthy, they'd be sold into slavery or they'd be raised up to be trained to fight in the gladiator games being murdered for sport. And it's why when Jesus shows up and he welcomes children around him, some of his disciples are like, hey, hey whoa, no, no, get, get those kids. Get those kids out of here, man. We don't want nothing to do with those kids. Those kids are, are unwanted. Those kids are the dregs of society, but Jesus, he's like, bro, oh, slow your roll, bro. Like, no, don't keep those kids away from me. I love kids. I, I welcome kids. And with that, Jesus changed the way an entire culture saw kids. And for people who viewed him as a Messiah, he changed the way an entire culture saw God. He showed them God's heart as a father. He revealed no matter how damaged they were or how unwanted they were by society, that God would rescue them by adopting them into his family. And what started happening was followers of Jesus began, they began imitating what Jesus modeled about his father. 
And so when Christianity started to grow in the early Roman Empire, Jesus followers, they, they started taking all these discarded, abandoned, abused kids. And when the scandalous people were trying to grab them, the Jesus people, they would jump on top of them, they would cover them, they would take them, and they, they started adopting them. Why? Because your theology always informs your activity. However it is you receive God is how you're going to reflect God. And you know, as brutal as the culture of the Roman Empire sounds, it's, it's really not that much different today. You know, the father wound in our culture is so deep. Over 40% of the kids in our country are gonna go to bed tonight without a dad. And that, that's created this huge void for those people, not just emotionally and relationally, but spiritually. It, it affects how they view God, in fact, Christian Smith, a noted sociologist, he conducted the largest study of teenagers and 20-somethings in American history. And he discovered the average young adult believes in something called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a, it's a big word, but basically what that means is their belief is, if there is a God, he's not here. He's far away. He's probably not coming back. So it's up to us to establish what's right by determining what takes away the pain and what makes us feel better. Because in the absence of a father, we will fill that void with something, with anything. It's why Father Seekers, the ministry my friend Pastor Barry runs, is so important to me because, because the odds are stacked against us. We are being led by fatherless fathers. There's a whole generation of them who are in danger of repeating a destructive pattern, desperately trying to fill this father void with something, with anything. But I need you to understand, God's not like that. He, he's not an absentee dad. He, he's not a father who abandoned his family. In fact, he's the exact opposite. He's looking for people who've been hurt and damaged, wounded and abandoned, left on the trash heap of life who can, who can, he can make a part of his family and change their identity and destiny by giving them his name and all the rights, benefits, and inheritance that come along with that name. I mean, does he have rules, a list of do's and not do's? Yeah, of course he does, but but they're not meant to harm you or hold you back. They're meant to help you, to, to keep you from harm. And, and he's given you way more rights than he has rules. Like, like he's put his name on you. And with that name, you gain access to all the benefits that come with that name. So, so you have to be taught. You have to be trained how to act, how to represent that name. It, it's like the Princess Diaries or, or like Little Orphan Annie, people that have no idea how to function in that sort of environment. And so, so we have the same thing in our own houses. You, you have it, I have it, the, the, you know, things like this. Remember, when you go to school today, you're representing the Hennessy name. <laughs> No pressure. Or like in this family, we this. Or in this family, we don't that. So basically, God's just telling us we're his image bearers. And everything we say and do, that it's a reflection on him. It's, it's what the commandment, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, is reflecting. He's saying, I've given you a chance. Don't waste it or use it in vain. I've, I've given you this gift. I've adopted you into my family. You're my son or my daughter. But in this family, son, in this family, daughter, we conduct ourselves in a certain way. In this family, we don't engage in sexual immorality or impurity. We're not greedy. We don't use foul obscene, vulgar language, associate ourselves with sinful behavior, take part in things that need to be done in the dark, or get drunk. Instead, we imitate God. We walk in love and in the light. We discern what pleases God. We walk in wisdom. We, we make the best use of our time. We worship Him for everything we have because we're filled with His Holy Spirit. We give thanks. Thanks that while we were lost and abandoned, while we were thrown onto the trash heap of life, God proved his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That while we were still sinners, when no one else wanted us, 
when everyone else had walked away, he walked in. And when he walked in, he gave us a new identity. He adopted us as his sons and as his daughters. And I wonder today, will you walk in that new identity? I sure hope so, because God loves being a dad and he desperately wants to be yours. Would you close your eyes? You know, salvation at its core is just this recognition that you are an orphan, that you, you have been abandoned. And spiritually, you need a father. You need a relationship with someone who will love you, with someone who will nurture you, with someone who will care enough about you to tell you when you're wrong and to show you how to be right. That's what the Bible offers in this relationship of salvation between God and us. That God took his first son and he sacrificed him for all the rest of his sons, for all the rest of his daughters, and that if we would just acknowledge that sacrifice, if we would just embrace the opportunity for relationship, if we would just submit ourselves and sign the adoption papers, we'll be in communion with him for all of eternity. Maybe you're watching this today and you say, Sean, I'm not in that. I've not, I've not signed those papers. I've not submitted myself to that relationship, but you know inside of you there's this hole, there's this void, and something today while I was talking about fathers and talking about this relational dynamic, there was something in you that you, you panged for this. And so today we're going to give you the opportunity to connect with God, to allow Him to fulfill the relationship that He so desperately wants with you to be your Father. The Bible says to do that, you have to do two things. You have to confess and you have to profess. Confess that you are a sinner and profess that God can change that. And so, so today we're going to give you the opportunity to do both of those things. First, if you're here in the live building and you say, Sean, I'm a sinner and I want to receive Jesus and I want to allow him to be the father of my life. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And once you've raised your hand and put it back down, that's you confessing that you are a sinner. Secondly, I'm gonna ask you to repeat a prayer after me along with everyone else. And if you repeat that prayer and you mean it in your heart, the Bible says you will enter into a father-son, father-daughter relationship with God. So if you're here and you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with God, but I want to, with nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand right now? Great, listen, I'm gonna ask everybody in here to repeat these words after me, say, Jesus, my life is filled with sin. Please forgive it. Come into my life. Change me. Make me different. Make me new. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my dad. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. You just made the greatest decision of your life, and we want the opportunity to connect with you. And so if you take the card, if you're in the building, that's in the seat back in front of you or it's underneath your chair if you're in a front row, tear off the bottom part, fill in whatever information you're okay with us having, check the box that's highlighted in yellow that says I'm choosing to follow Jesus. You can put it in the black buckets when they come around here at the end. Or you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you or on the screen at the front. We just want the opportunity to connect with you and to help you become more like Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes one more time before we receive the Lord's tithes and your offering. I wonder if you're here today and you say, Sean, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl, but quite frankly, I really have been living in my old identity. You have not fully embraced God of the relationship of being your father. If that's you, would you just throw your hand up today so that I can pray for you? And so God, today, it, it's like such a difficult transition to make, to go from being people that just like serve you or, or kind of like submit to you to being people who enter into this beautiful father-son, father-daughter relationship. And so I pray that whatever things have held that up, that you change that, break that down. That my friends in this place, that they would acknowledge who they are and that they would walk in the blessing, that they would receive the inheritance that you have as their kids. In Jesus' name, amen.